tomorrow, um, we'd like to meet in the Royal Academy uh, quadrangle out here at 8 o'clock. Um, please don't be late. We have a very heavy schedule and, and a long distance to go. And we want to get out of London before the traffic uh, builds up too much. For those of you, um, if you could bring a packed lunch, and for those of you <coughs> staying in um, hotels who, who might have difficulty getting hold of packed lunches, the um, sandwich bars in the area, particularly the Pret-a-Manger, is open from 7.30, so you would be able to come uh, and get sandwiches in, uh, on your way in. Um, I'd just like to give the History of Geology group a bit of a plug. Now you've all had such a wonderful uh, day and you're going to have another wonderful day, you might think about wanting to join us. Um, there is a little leaflet in your abstract booklet. It only costs seven pounds. There's a, a regular newsletter and we hold uh, twice, twice uh, yearly meetings and, and field trips. It's, it's quite a fun society to be part of. We very much welcome you. Right, I'll hand over to Richard Wilding. Just very briefly, well, today we continue with uh, the story which was told yesterday and now moving nearer and nearer the present time. Uh, Shakespeare has a phrase which I'm very fond of. <coughs> Uh, in Twelfth Night from the characters, is the whirly gig of time brings his revenge. Whirly gig is a lovely image, I think, of time, but it also brings development. And the development of the concept of time is continuing today. And our, I'm now just going to shut up and introduce our chairman for the day, Professor Jane Plant of the British Geological Survey, Cuba. Jane. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to start by saying, as a geochemist, how fascinated I've been in your uh, meeting. I certainly didn't know the history of my own subject, I discovered. Um, so congratulations to you for um, your excellent meeting. Um, before, um, well, perhaps now we'll, we'll just introduce our first speaker, who's Professor Stephen uh, G. Brush, who's Distinguished Professor of History of Science at the University of Maryland, USA, and we're particularly delighted that so many people from the USA are here um, with us. And his talk is intriguingly titled, Is the Earth Too Old? Stephen. Thank you. I'd like to raise the uh, question in this talk, what difference does it make? what the age of the Earth is. Uh, does it make a difference if the Earth is uh, only 6,000 years old, uh, which is, uh, as we heard yesterday, the uh, type of number that comes out of the biblical chronology? Uh, if uh, Buffon says it's 75,000 years old, does that mean that you are somehow uh, being disrespectful to religion? Uh, if uh, Darwin says that it's uh, more than 300 million years old. That gets him into trouble uh, with the uh, physicists. And uh, if, uh, uh, in this case, uh, Kelvin and his colleagues eventually get the figure down to 24 million years old, so uh, 
whether you believe the Earth is 24 million years old or more than 300 million years old indicates so where you stand in this uh, uh, partly mythical debate uh, between the physicists and the uh, naturalists uh, and biologists in the late 19th century. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about today uh, is uh, what happens if you believe that the Earth is more than 3,000 million years old, uh, how does that get you into conflict with the astronomers uh, in the 20th century? So that's going to be uh, my topic uh, for this morning, uh, a fairly narrow period of time between about 1929 and 1952 when there appeared to be uh, a situation where the Earth's age, as determined by Arthur Holmes, as you will find in, here in detail in the uh, next talk, uh, seemed to be at least 3,000 million years, uh, whereas uh, the age of the universe, as determined by the astronomers and cosmologists, uh, seemed to be less than 2,000 million years old. Uh, so that was the bone of contention. In other words, I'm saying that uh, the thing which is really interesting about the age of the Earth to me, uh, as a non-geologist, is uh, how it measures the conflicts, the boundaries, between different fields of science. Uh, I would, would remind you that, uh, for example, uh, <coughs> Martin Ludwig's remark yesterday, uh, geologists are interested in the calendar of, of events within the geological time scale, uh, not the numerical value of the total age of the Earth itself. Uh, and I think that a larger part of geology, uh, certainly up to uh, the 20th century, uh, it doesn't really make a great deal of difference what you think the total age of the Earth is. It's more important to have an ordered sequence of uh, events. Uh, so it's these, the way in which the age of the Earth uh, affects the interactions between uh, disciplines is what's of interest to me. Um, and uh, as, for example, as uh, Peter Bowler uh, mentioned uh, in introducing the speakers yesterday, uh, in the 19th century, the fact that uh, physicists like Lloyd Kelvin were putting uh, a rather low age on the age of the Earth, uh, low value, uh, only 24 million years, uh, w which was perceived as evidence against Darwin's theory of evolution, uh, led to a, uh, I think he used the word plethora, of non-Darwinian theories. So uh, other biologists who accepted the qualitative idea of evolution nevertheless felt that they had to have an accelerated process which would get the job done from then to now uh, in a much shorter period of time. And in his uh, book uh, on Kelvin and the Age of the Earth, Joe Birchfield uh, describes one of these theories, Debris' uh, mutation theory, which appeared to be very explicitly tailored to this 24 million year uh, limit. One of its advantages was that it achieved the process of evolution in 24 million years. So, in other words, I'm interested in how does uh, the perception that the age of the Earth has a particular value affect the theorizing that goes on uh, not just within geology but in other subjects where uh, such a value for the age of the Earth uh, might be important. Uh, now, I'm going to be talking in a sense about, at least in this early uh, part of my talk, the effect of the subsequent formation of planets like the Earth. So we would not be willing to accept this proposition that the Earth might be approximately as old as the universe. However, uh, I will have to ask you to consider that as a serious possibility because according to the theories of the origin of the solar system that were, uh, in fact, uh, widely accepted uh, in the 1920s, the solar system was formed by the encounter of two stars uh, in which, uh, somewhat like the, the, the uh, theory of Buffon that was uh, discussed yesterday, uh, a passive, the sun already exists, another star, instead of a comet, as Buffon would have it, but another star 
uh, comes near to the sun but draws material gases, hot gases, out of the sun uh, and these gases are then uh, condensed into uh, the planets. Now that's a process which seems now to be very unlikely because there's so much space between the stars. The universe is so huge uh, that there's lots of space between the stars. It seems as though it would be very <coughs> unlikely that uh, the, the uh, stars could get close enough together so that a process such as that uh, would happen very often. Uh, and of course, there are lots of other reasons why even if it did happen, it wouldn't lead to uh, planets that would be habitable in which life could evolve. However, in the 1930s, uh, and this is where the, one of the basic premises of the expanding universe comes in, uh, there was perhaps a period of what they called cosmic congestion uh, around about the time when the expansion started, around about the time what we would now call the Big Bang, uh, when everything was close together, when in fact all the stars were crammed into a small space. Now you see this is a somewhat, uh, from our point of view, inaccurate way of describing it, but that was the type of situation which was being contemplated, that if you uh, extrapolate the expansion back and to backwards in time, you get to the point when all the stars and galaxies were crammed into a small space. So it's quite reasonable that during that <coughs> period of time, you would have a uh, fairly frequent uh, rapid formation of planetary systems because stars would be bumping into each other all the time. Okay, so therefore, the proposition that the uh, Earth could be approximately as old as the universe, approximately in the cosmological scale of, of errors, of, you know, a <coughs> factor of 10 doesn't bother you too much, a uh, factor of 2 is certainly tolerable, was possible. Okay, so you have to keep that in mind as part of the context of assumptions. Now, another thing which you have to know about the history of cosmology and astronomy in the 1920s is that there was, uh, for that period of time, short period of time, something called a long time scale, which was in effect, which was uh, proposed by, particularly advocated by James Jeans, uh, and supported and somewhat based on the research of Arthur Eddington, uh, that if you try to understand the evolution of the stars as a slow process of transformation of mass into energy, in other words, we already had Einstein's theory of E equals mc squared, uh, Eddington asked the question then, how long would the stars live? How long would it take them to, to develop? if their source of energy was simply the transformation of mass into energy uh, and giving radiation at something like a reasonable rate. Uh, genes looked at it from a somewhat different point of view, uh, taking the system of stars as similar to a system of gas molecules and saying, well, how long would it take for them to reach uh, statistical equilibrium? The estimates that came out of that work of genes and Eddington was uh, that the period of time, the age for the age of the stars, at least, was something like 10 to the 12th years, millions of millions of years. Uh, and so that was the question, uh, that was the age of the universe, was at least 10 to the 12th uh, years. And of course, as long as you believe that was true, then Arthur Holmes' figure of 3,000 million years for the age of the Earth didn't give you any problem, okay? Now, then we get to the next stage in the development of physics, which is Einstein's general theory of relativity and the application of this theory uh, by Friedman, the sitter, and Lemaitre, uh, who discovered that according to the equations of Einstein's theory, uh, you can have a universe which expands, contracts, oscillates back and forth, all kinds of interesting possibilities come out of these equations. Now, Einstein uh, did not initially recognize the possibility <coughs> that the universe could uh, expand, uh, and he was thinking in terms of a static universe, and of course if the stars and galaxies are just sort of sitting <coughs> where they are and exerting gravitational forces on each other, then 
uh, according to the laws of physics, it would the whole universe would contract, it would collapse because the long-range gravitational force would eventually draw everything together. So in order to avoid that possibility, Einstein proposed the uh, so-called cosmological constant, which was simply a long-range repulsive force which could counteract the attractive force of gravity in order to maintain the stability of the whole system. So the purpose of the cosmological constant was to uh, prevent the universe from contracting under its own weight. Uh, and then, after these other theories were developed, uh, which showed that the universe could be expanding, then Einstein decided, well, the cosmological constant was really uh, unnecessary. But it was too late for him to call it back. Uh, and other people picked this up and found it to be still uh, a useful uh, device. In fact, just within the last two years, the cosmologists uh, have invoked the cosmological constant again in order to explain why the expansion of the universe seems to be accelerating despite the uh, effect of gravity. So, uh, rather notorious, uh, scandalous history of that constant, which according to legend anyway, Einstein called the worst blunder of my life was to even introduce that idea. Okay, now, during this period of time when the theorists, the relativists, uh, were coming to uh, accept the idea that the universe might be hypothetically expanding, the astronomers were doing measurements which led to the conclusion that the universe actually is expanding. And these uh, observations were, on the one hand, observations of the so-called redshifts of distant galaxies, the fact that if you identify the spectral lines of certain particular elements, in the spectrum of a star or galaxy, uh, you try to identify it with uh, the ones that you measure in the laboratory for certain chemical elements, uh, you find that the ones most of the time are shifted toward the red end of the spectrum. And uh, if you believe, this is, this is a big if, I don't emphasize the if, if the red shifts are to be interpreted as the motion away from the observer, then you could say that you have, uh, these represent motion of the galaxies away from us. And if you then couple this with the, uh, with the actual determination of the distances of these galaxies, which was again a major effort in astronomical research in the beginning of the 20th century, then uh, Hubble put these numbers together and was able to produce his grand generalization that the uh, redshifts of these galaxies were, roughly speaking, on the average, proportional to their distances. Okay, so uh, we have Hubble's law, which was first presented in 1929, that the redshifts of distant galaxies are proportional to their distances. Now, the interesting thing is that Hubble does not exactly say that means their motions are proportional to the distances. Rather, they're red shifts, and everybody sort of assumes, of course, red shift is Doppler shift, it means uh, motion. Now, if the expansion rate, uh, which is inferred from this, and if you say they are motions, these, are, these, mean that these red shifts mean that the galaxies are, in fact, moving away from us, then if the fact that they are moving faster, the farther away they are, is easily interpreted to mean that the universe is expanding. And if you then say, what was the situation in the past, it means that in the past, the galaxies were much closer to each other, and perhaps sufficiently far back in the past, they were all sitting on top of each other. Uh, so if the expansion rate is always the same, then there's a, a, a parameter which is called the Hubble time, which measures this. and in a sense, it's the, uh, the time since the beginning, since the point in the past when all of the galaxies were together, what we would now call uh, the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, let's have the first uh, <coughs> two slides here. I'll turn this off. Um, here we have Hubble, uh, and let's show the next slide, uh, Holmes, if that one comes up, right? Yes. So you might say, and that's all I'm going to use the slides for. Okay, so now 
Uh, you could say that what I'm talking about is a debate between Hubble uh, and Holmes, that the Hubble time, uh, that is the expansion of the universe, uh, is determined from the expansion of the universe. Using the astronomical data available in the 1930s is less than 2,000 million years. Uh, if you have gravitational deceleration, it's even less than that. The age of the Earth, according to Holmes, is greater than 3,000 million years. Now, this did not become a problem until around 1935, because as long as you had the long time scale, that was not necessarily the age of the universe. In the around 1935, the long time scale was rejected for a number of reasons I will not go into, and the encounter theory was also rejected as a theory for the origin of the solar system. So after 1935, you could no longer fudge the issue. You, could, you really had a very clear conflict between these uh, two ideas. How did the res astronomers respond to this? Well, uh, one response was to say, well, the Hubble time does not measure the actual age of the universe, but only the time when the expansion began. And before that, there was a sort of an indefinite period of time when the universe was sort of metastable, uh, and then it started to expand. This is the so-called Lemaitre model. Uh, now, Hubble's response is very interesting because you would expect him to be defending this. Uh, but I'd like to, uh, again, uh, quote one of the previous uh, speakers uh, yesterday, uh, I think it was Martin Rudwick who said, geologists rarely bother to read the works of their icon or father figure, and referring to Hutton. Same is true of astronomers. Uh, astronomers, most of them, uh, don't seem to bother to read what Hubble said, and in fact what Hubble said was not that the universe is expanding, but rather that the redshifts may or may not represent actual expansion. And in fact, around 1935, he worked with his colleague uh, Tolman at Caltech on two models of the universe, one in which the redshifts are interpreted as expansions, the other in which they are not. They're due to some other mysterious cause. And the data using Hubble's astronomical observations clearly favored the non-expanding model. So this was a great puzzle to Hubble. But because of his own research, he could not really come out and say the universe is expanding. Uh, in fact, he very much doubted it according to his published words. So he has said these are basically just apparent velocities, the redshifts. So Hubble, in fact, did not defend the idea of the expanding universe, contrary to what many people think about uh, Hubble as the so-called father of the expanding universe. The third response was the uh, steady state universe of Hoyle, Bondi, and Gold proposed in 1948. Now, they avoided the whole problem by saying that uh, even though the universe is expanding, uh, at the same time, uh, new matter is being created. And in fact, the universe is infinitely old. So the Hubble time does not indicate an actual beginning of the universe. It simply measures the expansion rate. But new galaxies are created at the same rate that the old galaxies sort of go over the horizon uh, so we can't see them anymore. So they avoided the problem by simply uh, saying that, that uh, the universe is infinitely old, therefore there's no problem about the uh, Earth being older uh, than the universe. Uh, how did the geochronologists respond to this debate? Uh, they, in fact, uh, did not make any concessions at all, uh, any compromise with the astronomers. Uh, on the contrary, they made the situation even worse by increasing the age of the Earth to uh, 4,500 million years in the 1950s, again, as we will hear later today. Uh, so the resolution of the whole conflict was, in fact, that the astronomers blinked. They decided that their own observations had been inaccurate, uh, that they uh, needed to revise the distance scale uh, for the expansion, uh, and the result was to double the distance scale, and then later to double it again, uh, so that the Hubble time uh, got quickly, very quickly, up to about uh, 10,000 million years, 10 billion years. Uh, this work was done by Walter Bodd uh, and others around 1952. Uh, and that, of course, was the end of the uh, conflict as it was uh, played out in this period between 19. 
1929 and 1952, that the result of the conflict between the uh, astronomers and the geologists, or the astronomers and the geochronologists using radiometric dating, was that the age of the Earth, as determined, was not reduced in order to comply with the with demands of astronomy, but in fact was even increased, and it was the astronomers who decided that they had been wrong, and that they needed to, uh, not necessarily because of the age of the Earth problem, but for other reasons. Bob had begun doing his research even before uh, the 1930s, uh, so you can't really say that because of the conflict, therefore, the astronomers did this and that. But it was clear that that was the actual effect of uh, the result. I, and I think that uh, I have uh, one more sentence to say, uh, and that is that uh, one of the effects of this controversy, therefore, was to delay the ultimate acceptance of the Big Bang cosmology. Uh, because it let the steady state people come in with their alternative, and there is a further debate between that and the Big Bang. Uh, I think without this conflict, perhaps the Big Bang theory would have been well established uh, by 1955 or 1960. Thank you. for example, he says, uh, this is 1931, he says, uh, at the time the Earth was created, that was a good time for creating planetary systems because the stars were close together. <coughs> Later, because of the expansion of the universe, the stars got farther apart, and it was much less likely that planetary systems would be created in later periods. Therefore, it's quite likely that we are the only life in the universe because you know it's too late for any universe any life to be created in the later periods uh, and he seems to sort of relish the idea that we are all alone in the universe so his views sort of represent the transition period between his own original long time scale uh, and the recognition of the idea of the expansion universe he's still sorting things out in 1931 okay, very quickly, if you could, please. Okay. Uh, my, my answer was um, The age of the star was a question isn't about to lie down. Um, there are two reasons why the sun must be older than the planets, perhaps by a very large amount. Take first the six degree tilt of the planetary plane relative uh, to the solar equator. As Jean, who you have already mentioned, Littleton, Gold, and Wilson had all its pointed out in succession. Uh, a single contracting solar nebula won't do that. And there's no way you can tilt the plane later without messing up the planarity. <coughs> the easiest way to solve this is to form the sun in one cloud and have it fly into another and acquire a disk with a different dynamical axis. This scenario helps a lot with nuclides, or short light nuclides in meteorites, and explains how a 100 million year old star like Vega has a disk. So the sun could be quite a bit older. The second reason, the roughly 50% shortage of solar neutrinos is potentially hugely damaging. Processes inside a star must generate enough pressure to support the outer layers. As neutrinos measure the rate of nuclear synthesis inside the sun, the alternative is a star. Either the reaction calculations are off the creek, in which case how do you able to design a hydrogen bomb, or else, as I now think, there's an additional pressure support force that hasn't been recognized. But in either case, the sun and all other stars could be around 50% older than we now think. Uh, yes, thank you for that comment. I think that illustrates very well what science is, how science works, that you solve a controversy and then you find some of the same issues coming back a few years later under a different guise. 
Uh, but that's uh, very interesting to see how issues like this are still alive. There was one very quickly. Oh, very quickly. Uh, uh, Joe Kane, uh, Stephen, I, I wonder if you could say something about the relationship between the, the, the story in the 19th century disciplinary con conflict and the 20th century. And you seem to be suggesting that uh, uh, the 19th century story functions as a moral tale about, the, about arrogance uh, in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Right. Uh, you, look what they did. We, uh, it, from that story, we can extract a moral tale not to be arrogant, to be willing to accept new data so that we don't make that mistake. Is that, is that where you're going with that? That's, that's, that's Eddington in the 1920s says something very much like that. And, I, and I'm extrapolating from Eddington uh, and from the fact that the astronomers don't even challenge the, the geophysical results. They, uh, De Sitter, for example, says very clearly this age of the Earth is a very solid figure. It's unlikely that it can be changed by any argument. We have to live with it. Okay, so I'm saying that that's the effect of this debate was in people's minds was to draw conclusions like that. Eddington say, says it most explicitly. I think we've got to move on now, but can I just thank Stephen again for such a clear and interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is uh, probably needs no introduction, but um, Dr. Cherry Lewis is going to speak to us about visions of a geological time scale. Um, I'll just give a plug to her latest book, Why She Wires Herself Up. She's published a book, uh, which I think will be released shortly by Cambridge University Press called The Dating Game. So, Cherry is now going to speak to us on visions of geological time scale. Get a snapshot of you from this. Sure. Uh, okay. Okay. Here we go. Recording the whole conference. I'm recording. Yeah, I'm just uh, recording my father. All right. And uh, thought I'd get a snap of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
very persuasive.